This is Women's Leadership Success Podcast Radio, episode number 103. How much time do you spend each day pouring through emails? Probably too much. Multiply that by the number of people in a company, and it's easy to see that email has a potential to suck the profits out of any enterprise. Used properly, however, it can boost your productivity enormously. Communications expert Diana Boer will show you how to pack your emails with punch and get the desired responses you want. In this tip-filled interview, Diana proves that how you handle email can determine the trajectory of your career. Join us today to master your emails. You can learn to make them faster, fewer, and better and stand out as a clear communicator and leader. Welcome to Women's Leadership Podcast, showing you how to influence people, improve your performance, and advance your career. Brought to you by women's leadership and career expert Sabrina Brom and womensleadershipsuccess.com. Here's your chance to meet women trendsetters leading the way to success, accomplishment, and balance in business and life. No matter if you're a manager, CEO, or entrepreneur, join Sabrina for coaching and no-nonsense advice to improve your career and bottom line. This is Women's Leadership Success.com radio podcast, and today I'm delighted to be interviewing Diana Boer. Her life work has been centered around communication in all its forms, oral, written, interpersonal, and enterprise-wide. She is the author of 48 books, translated into 60 60 languages, as well as numerous co-authored books. She has traveled the globe, talking with clients and organizations on six continents about communication challenges they face at work and at home. She is based in Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Her firm, Boer Research Institute, works with organizations to help them communicate clearly and with leaders to expand their influence by a strong executive presence. During her more than three decades at Boer Research Institute and at the earlier Boer Consultant, she and her team have provided communication training programs, coaching consulting to governmental agencies and more than one-third of the Fortune 500 organizations. Wow, Diana, that's really impressive. Welcome. Well, thank you. It's great to be with you again. Thank you. And um, this is the third time that you have been on the show, and you've set a record because I haven't ever had anybody on three times. <laughs> well, well, good. That's a, that's a great record. I'm proud of that. It's, it is a great record, and I do coaching and consulting, and I recommend your books a lot. I have an online course that I've just come out with. And your um, communicate like a leader, and your um, e- executive presence books are listed as references in my course. Right. Um, the thing that I really like about your work is how easy it is to digest and begin to put into practice. And um, on a personal note, you of the hundred. And five people I've interviewed in the last 10 years, you are the easiest to work with. Oh, well. So. I, I work on that. <laughs> well, it, it shows. And what's clear is that you are a really nice person and that you really care about other people. And that really comes through. Well, so. Thank you so much. I appreciate those comments. <laughs> you're welcome. I really enjoyed your book. Um, the, the latest book, which is Faster, Fewer, Better Emails, Manage the Volume, Reduce the Stress, and Love the Results, um, and is and is my practice. I read the whole book, um, and I found it to be even more useful than I thought it was going to be when I picked it up. Um, I'll say this later in the show, but one of the things I think if you are serious about developing your career, you need to have this book as a reference guide to keep improving the way you're communicating. It is, it is outstanding. Um, so let's, let's start out. You, you did a, a, 
nationwide survey of email habits. What were some of the surprising things you discovered about what people are doing or not doing with their emails? Well, Spring, one of the most shocking things I think I've discovered is just how much time people spend on email. We found that 42%, so basically half of the workforce, is spending three hours or longer every day answering email. Wow. And that's astounding to me. And, and one of the things, too, that I think is it's a bad habit that I'm sure we'll get into later is that more than half, 55% of the people spend at least uh, a part of their hour, every hour, in other words, checking email. They just continually leave it open all the time. It's just one eye. You know, a lot of times people have two monitors setting up and they just have one eye on that email all the time or they open it up at least once an hour, the check email coming in. So it becomes just a, a constant distraction for them. Uh, so that, that's a huge problem. And then I guess the third statistic that I would say is really shocking to me, that a third, 30, 31%, roughly a third, say they spend a third of their time looking, uh, spend 20, excuse me, 20 minutes a day just looking for information because they've lost it. You know, they uh-huh. want to send some information. They need to send the detail. They need to attach a document. And they can't find it. So if you're spending 20 minutes every day, uh, think how that adds up over yes. a month. So that tells me not only do they not know what they want to say in the email and they have bad habits, but they're just not saving the work to the right place. They're disorganized in general about communication. Wow, that's that's pretty shocking. And this is it this is something that happened to me last week. I was at a women's event and sitting at a table with eight women and we were talking about something we would like to change in our businesses Mm -hmm. and three of the eight women said they didn't have one minute of alone time in their lives and um that's that would be a fun conversation for you and i to have at another (laughs) point (laughs) but Mm -hmm. if you could shave some time off the email you might be able to carve out 20 minutes for yourself. <laughs> right. Oh, a lot more than 20 minutes because uh, a goal for most people should be to get to zero inbox at the end of the day. And very few people do. I know when I was uh, working to publicize faster, fewer, better emails right back in June when it came out, the, I, I put some notes on or some posts on, on Facebook and LinkedIn, wherever, and several people, you would be surprised how many people commented about having overflowing inboxes, but several people said on there that they had let their inbox grow until it had thousands of emails. And several people said, I just let it compile, I mean, pile up and pile up until I change email addresses. They just go get another. Oh, my gosh. You know, they mentioned having 3,000 and 16,000 and 22,000 emails, and then they just open another account and change email. Can you imagine how stressed that would be? So if you could learn some habits to cut down on that clutter and not spend three hours every day and actually get through it, how much more efficient your life would be and less stress. That's great. And I'm I'm not at 3,000, but... I want to confess that I have 600 sitting there. I, and since I read the book, I've been working on it every day, but I still haven't gotten it down to zero every day. And so um, I'm wanting to learn what I need to do. And one of the things that I really like in, in changing my behavior and other people's is small steps that you can do towards the big goal. So I'm going to be asking you about that as we keep talking. Okay. Um, so in the, talk, talk to us about cutting the clutter first. Yeah, and that's when I started off, you know, in that first chapter of the book, because I figured people wanted to get rid of that clutter. And I uh-huh. started with those dozen strategies. A, a quick strategy is just not to use your inbox as a to-do list. A lot of people just let the in, they open up an email and they think, well, I, I can't do this now. I'm waiting on a report or I'm waiting on some information or I can't do this until I'm going to make up my mind if I'm going to attend that conference. So, and, and rather than file that appropriately or make some kind of note of how you're going to handle it, they let it set there open in their email box. Then they go to the next email. 
Well, in two or three days, they can't remember what they were supposed to do with that email, you know, particularly if now that they have a dozen in there and then they have, you know, 42 in there and now they have 122 in there and they keep stumbling over it. And pretty soon, sometimes that email just gets lost in the pile. They just keep overlooking it. And even if they do remember, I need to do something with it. They have to open it up and reread it again. Okay. To remember, oh, now, what was that detail and what was that date and what am I supposed to tell them? And so they're rereading and doubling their workload. And so just don't use it. Don't use that inbox as the to-do list. Immediately when you read it, just decide, delegate, uh, pull it over on your calendar if you're going to do it. But at another time, pull it over on your calendar. You, if you've got, if, for example, if you're using Outlook 365, you can just literally drag it over on your calendar on that date and drop the email on that date and it will pop up on that date. Or make a note. On a physical calendar, I keep the electronic calendar and then the physical calendar for task list. And so if I think I can't do this until I make a decision by next week, I'll have a decision. I make a note, decide on such and such over on the physical calendar and then delete that out of the box. File it on that person's contact record with your data management. So just remember, that's not your to-do list. So Get rid of it. I, I definitely need help here. I'm on Google and I think a physical calendar would work work for me. Um, so I would just go to the physical calendar and mark down. Yes. What just that email- on such and such and reply to Joan. And that's, that's all you need to do. And then delete that or, you know, save it to Joan Smith's record or whatever. Okay. And that's get out great. of your to-do list. Great. Um, the other thing that I find confusing, and may, I don't know if this is true on the other platforms, but on Google, on the Google, the subject line, I'll see the subject line and I'll think, okay, I replied to that. And they're doing a thread where they're, they've added some brand new thing. And I've missed things because I thought I had already covered it. Yes. You want to use, uh, when you have a long thread and back and forth, back and forth, the subject almost always changes. You're not on the... Right. Subject again. Right. When the subject changes. You need to change the subject line because what happens when you file it, let's say you've had, you know, 17 iterations of something back and forth. Right. And that all gets saved to your database. And then somebody asks a question or they need a detail. You've got to open up 17 emails to find that detail. So you're re- reading 17 emails. Again, a big waste of time. So when the subject changes, either start a new email or change the subject line on it so that when you need to go back for a reference and look at something, you can find it immediately without opening up 17 other emails to check it. It also prevents confidentiality leaks. You know, a lot of times, let's say you had six passes at, you know, discussing this back and forth with a person. And then all of a sudden you decide to take some action and one person needs to delegate this task to their team member. And they pass it on, forgetting that back there on that first email, you mentioned some confidential information. Right. Or even in, you know, email three, you said something that totally confuses them and makes no sense to the person you're delegating to. And so then they come back with questions thinking, well, how does this apply to me? And they're totally confused. And then you got to write three more emails to say, never mind, that didn't apply to you. Uh Uh-huh. So. They're long email threads can be dangerous or, well, I don't want to say always dangerous unless it's confidential, but they can be cumbersome for many reasons. So when the subject changes, change your subject line and then people can stay straight or you can delegate off to someone else and, and not endanger all the rest. What do you think about just stopping the thread and starting, starting a new email? What do you, is that an okay thing to That's do? Great. That's great. It's, it's far better of where I'm concerned because of the confidentiality thing and because of needing to copy other people that the rest of it doesn't apply to. Okay. Any other clutter yeah, suggestions? Yeah. Uh, when we're talking about reducing the clutter, a lot of people create their own clutter. And I, what I mean by that is they don't use the appropriate tools, software tools. You know, when we first got into email, that's all we had. So we used email to schedule things, to schedule meetings. We used it to uh, to comment back and forth with the project team on a on a, a key project that several people are involved in. Now we have more appropriate tools. So just use email for correspondence. 
and not for all these other things. Use a scheduling package or a project management package like uh, Trello or Slack or whatever. If you're co collaborating on a project, just use the appropriate tools. And then another one that I see, a uh, uh, habit that I see that creates a lot of clutter is not acknowledging. And what, you know, when somebody emails you something or sends you something, asks for something, and you don't reply, you think, well, I, I can't answer that till next week. I'll get back to them. They don't know if you got it or not. And email does frequently go astray. <laughs> it, uh -huh. it really does. And it gets delayed. So just by saying, I got it. I'll get back to you with a complete answer next Friday after I hear from John. And that lets people know, okay, you don't need to send me a reminder. You don't need to send a follow-up. You don't need to call. You don't need to chase me down. I got it. When you don't acknowledge, people think, well, did, did they get this or not? And so they'll send you a reminder and a reminder and another note and contact you on social media and send you a direct message and maybe send you a text. And they're, they're sort of chasing you from channel to channel. Uh -huh. What would prevent all that is if you just sent them an acknowledgement and, and say, I got it. I'll get back to you on Friday. Uh -huh. uh, another thing that is an irritation to a lot of people and creates clutter for all your colleagues is improperly using reply all. You know that feature? Oh. Uh, <laughs> let's say a, a middle management person is Send, getting ready to send out some kind of report to their boss in headquarters. And they've got, you know, 10, 10 direct reports. And they say, I'm, I'm putting together this quarterly report and uh, I've attached it here. Please read it. See if there's anything you, we need to modify or add or delete. If there are any changes, let me know. Well, what you'll frequently see is all 10 will reply and say, looks fine. No problem. Uh, it's okay with me. Don't have anything to add. And all those 10 responses with nothing substantial go to 10 other colleagues. Yes. And it's not that it takes long for them to read it, but it's just a distraction. It's just one more email to open, right. up, and open up and read. Right. And, and so the person who sends that out thinks, why did they respond to me if they didn't have anything to add? But it's really the writer's fault. The writer should have used the reply all appropriately by saying, I'm attaching such and such quarterly report. I think it's in order, but please review it. If you have any changes, let me know. Otherwise, do not reply all. Reply to me directly. Or oh, beautiful. Reply, or reply all only if you have changes that everyone needs to see. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> and then you'd maybe only get one reply that hit 10 of the boxes. So well, using that feature appropriately is it would cut down on a tremendous lot of information. That's great. The other one that really kind of drives me crazy is how do I end the conversation? You know, I said, I said, um, for instance, um, I'm sorry uh, that there's no openings for you to be on my radio program. Then the person writes back something and I respond to that again they keep writing <laughs> and I it's like when you know, do I end you know that happens even when they're not asking you to do something you'll see emails that say uh, I sent such a long such a long to you and the other person says thank you and then they say no problem anytime I'll get back to <laughs> right now. right uh, it's kind of like you know I hate to, I hate to break this off and I don't want to be abrupt and you don't know when to stop. You, that happens in text as well. You want to not be abrupt, but when you're communicating with your colleagues, there should be a cultural understanding that once you acknowledge I got something, that you don't just keep on and on and on and on. Um, there is a difference between being clear and courteous and being abrupt and unclear. So you if you were clear and you said what you needed to, to say, it's fine to acknowledge and say thanks and then stop. <laughs> That's it. You don't need to keep going back and forth. Okay. And a lot of the people I'm communicating with are not colleagues I have at work. They're not mm -hmm. people I know very well. Well, so how do I know? I just, once I say thank you and they keep doing this and I can just stop. I'm not wanting to be rude. I just no, like, stop. Oh, yeah. Once oh, we got so you, much time. That's it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, 
quickly, I, all these, everything we've got on here, you could take a long time with, but I'm, I, can you say something about personal liability and um, how to protect oh, well, that's yourself? A big, that's a big issue. I, I am so glad you brought that up. You know, law firms get paid, obviously, to <clears throat> dig around an email to find things to make their case. Uh-huh. And m- most people know not to to do things like uh, you know uh, bring up safety issues or liability issues uh, and put it in writing. That's the reason they pick up the phone. But when you uh, even s- if you if you commonly send a report, a certain report to let's say six people for this meeting, and you decide to drop this one person off. They could make a case, and there's you know tracking in your company's archives of who gets what reports routinely. And all of a sudden, they could come back and say, "Look, for eight weeks or eight months, you send this report to these six people. This month, before this big, really important decision was going to be made at the monthly meeting, you didn't copy Julie on that. Why not? Did you not want her to have input? You know." So you want to, the, the key principle to, be in, to keep in mind is to be consistent. Be consistent in the timing that you send reports. Be consistent with your distribution list. And be consistent in responding. If people ask for a response, let's say you're the senior leader and you're sending out a, a document and you ask for a response and you typically respond about something and then all of a sudden you don't, the lawyers can make a case about why, why are you not responding? Did mm-hmm. you not want to express an opinion about this because it affects your commission or your paycheck or the way such and such is your lack of response? You know, what is the, what is the issue here? So there are all kinds of liability issues that I have discussed there that, that readers will really want to tune into. And maybe you even want to get into the, Cyber security issues here. I, I think more and more people are aware of, you know, not clicking on fishy looking, you know, fish phishing emails. And I'm talking about even fishy looking emails. Uh-huh. Some of those are hard to distinguish. But making sure that you know where that email came from, looking at the URL, mm-hmm. you know, that address, and yeah. looking at the um, uh, the spelling sometimes even if, if the address comes from somebody you know like a good friend uh-huh. uh, they can spoof those addresses now uh-huh. and spoof those addresses but even let's say an extra comma in the name or r n can look like m if you glance at it quickly uh-huh. and they've misspelled the name just slightly and it's not your friend it's it's uh, an attacker a hacker yeah. And so you want to just be really careful if you don't, even if you do recognize the name, to make sure that it really came from the person that, that you know and that you don't click on a, a link that you don't recognize if you're not expecting something. Just yesterday, in fact, I got a, an email that I wasn't expecting from my publisher about an agreement to sign. And it looked it was odd. It had a couple of grammatical errors and my publisher rarely ever makes a grammatical error on anything. Mm-hmm. And it just looked strange. And so I emailed back, not, not reply all because I didn't want to hit the reply all, but started a new email and said, Hey, Neil, did you send this agreement for me to sign? Is there some kind of amendment here that needs to be executed? And sure enough, he said, well, Wow, that looks terrible. I don't know how that got out. That was from us, but mm-hmm. that's exactly how emails look when they're phishing. And so that's that's really good. There. Really, I've got all kinds of stories. I've got all kinds of stories from the, from different people when I was researching this book about how they got caught. In fact, that's one of the statistics. Um, let me just be sure here. Um, it was something like a third of the 28 percent 28 percent of the people that were surveyed in the when I was preparing the book University of Northern Colorado conducted the survey for me 28 percent have been scammed by email and these are wow. white collar workers that I'm sure have heard and know better than to be clicking on links yet they got scammed by some kind of very sophisticated uh, cyber hack wow that's 
really good information. We're going to take a 30-second pause in our conversation. Um, I'm going to make an announcement, and then we'll come back to talking to Diana Boer. Did you know you can change your leadership trajectory just by understanding your talents and what areas you need to improve? Would you like an easy way to find out where you are in your leadership and career development? Well, here's how you can. I've designed a simple four-minute career and leadership quiz that will help you. And as one of my listeners, you can get it for free. Just go to careerdevelopmentquiz.com And once you are there, complete the confidential quiz. You'll get your score and suggestions immediately. Plus, you may even qualify for a free coaching session. So just go to careerdevelopmentquiz.com and fill out the quiz. Oh, Diana, this information is so great. Um, And I'm wondering if you could tell us what are the biggest mistakes that either make emails unclear or the writers look really foolish. And I want to just say that I'm not super confident about my grammar all the time. And you probably remember when I contacted you about doing the interview, I said, did I do this okay? <laughs> Which I, I was really comfortable asking you because I know you, you aren't judgmental. Um, you just would give me the information. Yeah, I, I replied to that you would be surprised how many people say, hey, I feel like since, since my field, of course, is writing, how many people respond and say, I feel like I'm writing my English professor here. <laughs> but th- that's, that's true. Uh, people do feel self-conscious about their writing. And So I, I love what you had in the book, and I have the book. And like I said, I recommend everybody get the book. So I want to know the biggest mistakes, and I'd also like to know, where do I start in terms of improving my ability to communicate better in writing? So, but the first question is, what are the big mistakes? I think one of the biggest mistakes <laughs> is um, the, what I call the once upon a time structure. A lot of people, because they tackle email in just a fast, they consider it a very casual communication method. They are the email comes in and they're in a hurry to answer and they just dump, they just do a brain dump and they don't think about the structure. And generally the structure that most of us think in is once upon a time, this happened to me or somebody asked me this and this is a situation and therefore here's the message and this is what I need you to do. And that's a backward structure. That's the way we think and reason. But when we output to someone else, we need to start with the message. This is, this is my point. This is what I need you to do, the action I need you to take. And in the meantime, here's some action. You may have action that you plan to take. And then you go back and elaborate on the details. So in other words, it's you ha- as, a, as a writer of email, you have the same kind of audience that the news media does. In other words, people are not reading for entertainment. They're reading for information. They need to do something. And if you just have 30 seconds to read the newspaper, you just read the headlines. And basically, that's what people are doing with email. Many times they're standing in the doctor's, you know, sitting in the doctor's office or standing in the grocery store checkout line, and they're just going through their emails very quickly. And so you want to put the key message in your headline or right up front. Don't start with the details. That's a key, key problem. And then another mistake, you asked me about mistakes. Uh, Another mistake is what I call the so what message. You read the email and you get to the bottom and you think, so what? (laughs) Why did you tell me this? The action is unclear. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's implied or you think you know what they're asking you to do, but it's unclear. And even sometimes when they ask you questions or you see an action, what they want you to respond to is unclear. They'll say, blah, 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 blah. Your thoughts? (laughs) Uh any input here and you're thinking my thoughts about what I mean I know the general subject but you would get much better response if you ask a series of specific questions you know you're discussing and it makes it so much easier for the other person (laughs) right you know maybe you're discussing a trade show to to go to if you're in marketing or you're you're discussing a conference and trying to decide if your team should go to that conference and you, you talk all about this conference and who's going to be there. And we went one year, but we didn't get two years. And you say your thoughts and you're thinking, 
are you asking me if we all should go or if I should go or if you should go or what the benefits are? are you asking me my thoughts about is the cost, you know, uh, the ROI or will our competitors be there? If, if you ask any of those questions specifically, you would get specific usable answers. But when you just ask a generic question like that, you got a, you know, a very 50 50 chance of getting what you want back. So that's another key mistake. I, I'm just going to, since I've read the book, <clears throat> I've gotten much better at my subject lines. Good. And I'm, I'm not as cryptic. I was, I was, I was putting almost like little cryptic bullet points, um, thinking almost, wow, the, I must be really important because look at how quickly I can get through this information and not really thinking about how hard it must, must be to read on the other end. It was saving me time, but it wasn't really helping me communicate with the other person. Right. So, so I, do, do just what you said. They write from their perspective rather than the reader's perspective, and they make it quick for them to dash through it. But reversing that and thinking, what does my reader need is a right. good thing. And, and the one of the things I like in the book is you, you give several sample samples of how to do it, which I found really helpful. And the other thing that I've paid more attention to is having a salutation and what I'm closing with. I'm, I used to not even put my name down, you know. Um, and you know, I'm that, embarrassed uh, to tell you that. I, it's, <laughs> you know, well, I'm, try that with that. You know, you asked me a question earlier about long long threads of uh-huh, back and uh-huh. back and forth. that's where that becomes a problem when you don't you know sign it or you don't have a salutation is when somebody else you know joins the conversation and they're trying to read back about who said what uh-huh. it's very hard to find out well now wait did tom say that to to joanne or did joanne say that to tom or did now who's come and you just have to keep going back through it and it's kind of like a, B, A, B, A, trying to figure yeah. out who said what. And it's just so much easier to know well, if people have signed it. And also, it, if I say, hello, Diana, or uh, hi, Diana, mm-hmm. you know I know you're a real person that I want to connect with, and it's not, I'm not talking to a robot. And the same if I do, if I end some way, I'm still a little confused about what to say at the end. I used to say warmly, but I'm thinking that isn't a good thing to end w- with. Um, well, you, it, because email is so informal, you don't always have to have that closing word, uh, particularly if you're going to go back and forth three or four times and then it's deleted. It's not something that's on file forever. I mean, okay. It's like you're in the middle of a conversation. So once you've addressed the other person, then they know it's you writing. In other okay. words, if I was addressing you back and forth, I would say, Sabrina, uh, yes, Friday's fine for the interview. And then my signature block there says who it's from. So, so that would be clear. I could say thanks, or I could say talk then, or um, maybe one time I'm saying um, glad, uh, looking forward to it, or just whatever you would say in person. Uh-huh. It, it, it doesn't have to be one of those formal closing words like sincerely or thanks or regards or warmly or whatever. Just your last closing line, like you would say if you were walking out of the room and we were together. And and then if we've repeated, uh, gone back and forth on the same conversation, you don't have to have a closing line because we're continuing the conversation. Think about it. We're continuing the conversation and we're going to email back and forth three or four times over today or over two days. I like that. It- I'm thinking of how many times I've said something like, have a nice holiday, you know, like Thanksgiving's coming up or Christmas. But what that does is it gets a whole bunch more back and forth, right? Yeah, as well. And if you said it once, that's fine. The person might say, you too, but then end it there. <laughs> you don't right. have to say, what, what the problem is, you say, have a nice holiday. And the person says, you too. I hope you're going to get to see your family. And you think, oh, well, I better say, oh, and I know that you like to take your whole uh, pe- all your, <laughs> your dog with you. I hope he doesn't get sick again. And that person says, oh, well, he did last time. And then, <laughs> and then you're in those six more emails. That's what you don't want to do. So this is, um, this is one that I struggle with. I'm better on the phone than I am in an email. And I sometimes wonder when, what, at what point do I just, in, for instance, 
I've had a couple people that I'm, I'm doing a consulting job and they've been really difficult to schedule time with. Um, and I finally called and that worked. But at what point do you say, okay, I need to just have a phone call with this person or walk into their office as opposed to keep the email going. What's your idea on that? I think that anytime, and there's a whole section, you know, in uh, uh, Fast If You're Better Emails, that very last chapter is on when to email and when to talk and when to go into a meeting. Uh huh. I, I sometimes just tell people, look, here's a situation. Get out the book and go through that because it can be very tricky. It, it can really be tricky. But there are several or eight, I could say seven or eight criteria each time you're trying to decide. One of the times in a situation you're raising right now about this consulting thing, do you need to see their facial expression? You know, in email, people may agree to something, but you never know when they're rolling their eyes and looking like, oh, over my dead body, am I going to do this? And you can see the resistance. If you need to see facial expression, you might need to meet them face to face. I'll have a Zoom call so you can see right. facial expression. Mm-hmm. Do you need to hear the tone of their voice? A, a lot of times you can tell more about they've said something very cryptically and then they stop. And you can't tell that pause in an email. Uh-huh. You can't pick up voice inflection in an email. All of those are occasions where you might think it's important. Also, if you need to negotiate details back and forth, let's say it's like you said, a consult, consulting occasion, and we don't mean necessarily with an outside client. This could be an internal negotiation right. with a worker about a deadline or when you're going to turn over a project, et cetera, budget discussion or whatever. And you know that in, in the course of a 15 minute situation dialogue, you are going to have to work together to collaborate to see what is the optimal time to get this report together, uh, how you're going to present information and a proposal, what kind of graphics you might need. That's very hard. I mean, that's going to necessitate six or eight emails back and forth when you could take care of it in five minutes if you could get in a dialogue. So just think, um, do I need to hear a tone of voice? Do I need to see facial expression? Do we need to make some quick decisions that can be made much faster? And how wide is the audience? Is this one person conversation or we need to have six people that might say, look, even if I do need to make several details, I need to send an email because we're not all available at the same time. So there, there are a lot of different criteria to consider and how, um, how confidential and do I want a record of it? So this is such good information, and so many people hate hate to write, even short emails, um, and they freeze and they have a difficult time getting started. Do you, do you have some tips for not only what they can do, but how 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 can I and other people keep improving our ability to write better emails? You know, I'm glad you asked that question about getting started. That is another key problem that a lot of people have. Uh, in writing workshops, they ask that a lot. How, uh-huh. do I, how do I get started? Here's a little trick. If you were talking to somebody, and most people don't have trouble communicating the message orally. So to translate that ability to writing, just use this little phrase. I'm writing to tell you that and finish the sentence. I'm writing to tell you that. And then when you get through, go back and delete the part I'm writing to tell you that. I mean, you literally can just lop off that part of it and what's left in the sentence will be appropriate. Wow, that's, that's a great tip. Um, gr- uh, quickly on the emojis. When, I, like, I like little emojis. When is it okay to send them, whether I'm texting or I'm using email? When is it okay to do that? When should I not well, do that? You know, the, the jury's still out on how people feel about that. It, 20 years ago, I wrote a book on writing with Simon and & Schuster. And in that book, I said, don't use them. They're just mm-hmm. not appropriate in business writing. Now, you'll notice in this new book, I said, hey, everything is more relaxed now. Our dress is more relaxed. Our air styles are more relaxed. Our, everything is more relaxed. But keep in mind the pros and cons. They're pros and cons. Uh, a benefit is that it gives people a little taste of personality. It's lighthearted. They're more casual. But the negative is that emojis can be misunderstood. 
I mean, you see a little bitty face there and you're thinking, what did they mean by that? It's a laugh. Is that a sarcastic laugh? Is that a, <laughs> you know, is that a happy right. laugh? Are they, you know, are they making fun? So you don't always know what that means. Right. So uh, being unclear is a, is a downside of it. And also, some people still just think it's totally inappropriate and think you're making light of a serious situation or you're not taking it seriously, you're too flippant, or they just might think you're not professional. Uh huh. So you want to be careful with that one. Yeah. So let's see. Grammar. How how important is that? And what can I do to improve my grammar? I think it is extremely important, and I I did not realize how important. Now it's always been important to me because English, you know, is my my undergraduate, my graduate right. English. So I. It's always been important to me, but I did not realize how extremely important it was to see sweet officers. When I began doing writing business and technical writing and proposal writing workshops, when, when we would have C-suite officers in these programs, and we don't always, sometimes they're just asking everybody else to go, but when we would, ha- when either when I would talk to them during a sales and marketing call or when they would be in the program they would always say, I want you to be sure to include a section on grammar because I'll just share this comment from one that one um, president, he always uh, comes to mind when, when somebody asks about grammar, he said to me, seeing, and this is a, a large credit card company. He said to me, when I see a grammatical error from somebody on my team, to me it says inattention to detail. It's an ad, it shows a, an attitude about the job that's laziness. Now, that not that same quote, but that attitude has surfaced over and over through the years because to them it's like I, I didn't care enough to protect our data. Um, if you remember the CEO of Scandinavian Airline once said when a passenger gets on an airplane and pulls down the tray and sees a big coffee stain there, to them it means we don't service our engine. I, I remember another banking uh, executive who said when they see a marketing letter go out from us talking about our interest rates that we charge on loans, to them, if there's a grammatical error in there, it's to them communicating that we don't amortize their loans correctly. So it's all about the image or the impression. And then you ask about how do you go about improving it? I I just want to make a comment here because in the book, you give some good examples of when commas are in the wrong place, it totally changes the message. Yes, it totally reverses it. Yeah. So court cases that revolve around that. Yeah. So I'm sorry, please go on. So how how do I improve? I feel like I want to do really good on this. I feel like I need work on my um, uh, where I'm putting my commas and my colons and more of that than saying the wrong verb or something like that. Right. How, I think what's you, a good way to start? First, I think you're already at the first step and that is awareness. Most okay. people don't aware how they're not aware of how important it is. And okay. so they just ignore it. So awareness is the first step taking some kind of assessment to learn what, you know, what your area, you already know, you said punctuation. It's not Uh choice, it's punctuation. Uh To find out what you need to have help in and then actually just memorizing the rules, just like you learn the rules of multiplication. You know, when you're in in grade school, you learn, okay, this is how you multiply. Just if I wanted to learn, math is one of my weaknesses. I just always hated math. But if I wanted to learn, you know, calculus or, or whatever, I would get the formulas and memorize them. Same thing with grammar. It's, it's logical. It really is. Now, the spelling, <laughs> English spelling is not logical. Right. But grammar rules are logical. And so it's to show you how it can be, le- grammar can be learned. We had, uh, when we hired trainers to do our workshops, to present our workshops, they go through a very rigorous training process, usually at minimum a year, but but for technical writing, to teach technical writing or proposal writing, two to three years, they have to follow a master trainer around and set in workshops to hear all the questions. But we test them. 
uh, not only on presenting those concepts, but on grammar, because they can be asked on the spur of the moment. Somebody can bring a document, hand it to them and says, and say, what's wrong with this sentence? My boss wants to know we're going to send this out this afternoon. And they really have to understand every technical aspect of grammar. So we've had sometimes trainers come in with a, a PhD, an academic degree that we want, but they are, they're weak in grammar and they test very low on that, on that uh, assessment. And we'll say, here's my grammar book. Go away and study this. Come back next week and take the test. And they will, they will ace the test. They will go from a very weak le- score to, to a master level score. Right. So part of it is just, just having an awareness that you want to learn the thing and start to study your, uh, your book. Mm-hmm. Your book is great, has the basic grammar things that you need to know. So you yeah, could just. And, uh, and this last one, it doesn't go through all the basics, but it has the most common errors. I think I put maybe 10 or so of the most common errors. I do have another grammar book. It's called uh, Boer's Rules for Business Grammar. And that one does have, uh, I think, 101 of the most common errors. This last book, the, the email book, Faster Fear, Better Emails, just has about 10 or so. So the um, Boer's Rules for Business Grammar, is that something that, that I could get and start studying to yeah. improve my grammar? Absolutely. And if you just read through that, and then there's another book that Random House, Penguin Random House did. It's called Good Grief, Good Grammar. And it's just a paperback. It's a very inexpensive little paperback book. And it goes through just the very basics all the way up to the most common business eras. Um, it starts with, you know, this is a noun, this is a verb, this is an adjective, this is an adverb, this is how they fit together in sentences. And then here are the most common mistakes that I see in business writing and in emails and in proposals, etc. So any of those, just read them from cover to cover. That one has exercises in it so you can test yourself at the end of every chapter. You can actually do a little exercise and test and see if you found it. And then it has the answers in the back of the book. Wow, that's. If you wanted to study that and spend a week on it, you could become a master in grammar. It's just like any other subject. That's great. I'm I'm well read, and I'm thinking the other thing that I need to do is reread the email I'm sending out before I push send to make sure it sounds okay. Right, right. You know, there there are tips. Uh, and there's still some software packages that help you, but occasionally there's some errors in that. And, you know, again, they don't always know the context and they don't always know the meaning of what you're saying. And so it, it, they're helpful. I'm not saying don't use them, but they don't always help you. And of course, all your messages in, in communication is not written. Sometimes it's oral, so you do know, need to know the difference. Well, this has been wonderful talking to you. Is there any last thing that you want to leave the audience with around emails and and communication? I would just say, don't create your own clutter. (laughs) Unsubscribe to what you don't need and work at zero inbox every day. Wow. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Diana. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. Sure. Would you like to be an exceptional leader? then please join me in this special series, Communicate Like a Leader. In this series, you will hear thought-provoking stories and get insider secrets to help you increase your influence, impact, and income. And if you would like to quickly find out where you are in your leadership development, here's how you can. I've designed a special four-minute career development quiz, and as one of my listeners, you can get it for free. Just go to http colon slash slash careerdevelopmentquiz.com. Once you complete the confidential quiz, you'll get your score and suggestions immediately. Plus, you may even qualify for a free coaching session. And lastly, can you do me a small favor? Our goal this year is to get 500,000 downloads of Women's Leadership Success. We have almost 335,000 downloads now. When we have more listeners, we can help more women be better leaders worldwide. Empowered women change the world. Here's how you can be part of this women's leadership global movement. By sharing this show or the particular episode that you have enjoyed in social media, subscribing and giving me a review on iTunes, Stitcher, and in our Women's Leadership Success page on Facebook. 
Thanks for your help, and bye for now. Thank you for joining your host, Sabrina Brahm, on another Women's Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email her at sabrina at sabrinabrahm.com. Since 1989, Sabrina and her team have helped hundreds of women managers, business leaders, and entrepreneurs with valuable trainings, articles, books, and executive coaching. For additional tips, interviews, and free access to Great Leaders Today mini-course, visit www.womensleadershipsuccess.com.